first off, it's, it'd be hard to identify anyone that hasn't had stroke touch their life either directly or indirectly through family or friends. So it's a devastating uh, injury and 85% of people that suffer an ischemic stroke have no treatment options. And psychedelic drugs, which of an area of great interest, we're investigating a psychedelic drug to treat stroke. It's not what you, what's not what most companies are doing. It's unique in that approach. And the preclinical early data is very promising. So I think there's a number of reasons why this will be an exciting uh, podcast to listen to. All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the NeuroFlex podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. I wanted to let you guys know a little about uh, one of the technologies that we use here at NeuroFlex called photobiomodulation. Uh, photobiomodulation is basically light therapy. It involves red and near-infrared light energy that's absorbed by the mitochondria in various tissues in the body. We specifically focus in on the brain, which is chock full of mitochondria. So this photobiomodulation causes hypoxic or low oxygen cells to release nitric oxide, which is a key neurotransmitter that regulates blood flow and restores oxygen to the affected areas. And this technology also results in the activation of self repair mechanisms in the brain. It regulates gene expression and controls the production of growth factors along with anti-inflammatory cytokines. So that's a service that we're currently offering uh, mobile um, to clients interested in peak cognitive performance in the Miami Fort Lauderdale area. So if that's something that interests you, you can go ahead and check us out at www.neuroflex.com. That's N-U-R-O-F-L-E-X.com. You can shoot us a DM at Neuroflex Florida on Instagram. On to today's interview, uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Christopher Moreau. Uh, Mr. Moreau is the CEO of Algernon Pharmaceuticals and is a member of the company's board of directors. With over 30 years of executive management experience overall, including 15 years in CEO roles, he has proven achievements in operations management, acquisitions, licensing, and integration. Mr. Moreau also has significant experience managing biotechnology research programs and a deep expertise in business development and capital markets, having raised more than 50 million. He has also been featured on numerous business television and social media interviews and is a highly skilled communicator and sought after speaker recently appearing as a guest lecturer for the University of East London Pharmacology Program. And uh, I uh, became aware of, uh, of you know, Chris's research and, and Algernon at the, the recent microdose conference, the psychedelic conference in Miami about a month ago. And they presented some really, really fascinating research that we're going to discuss in the interview today. So, so Chris, really, really excited to have you on the show. Great. Thank you. Uh, nice to be here and, and talking about DMT. Yes. Yes. So that's, that's one that's really interesting in the sense of, uh, you know, we hear a lot about ketamine, psilocybin, uh, you know, DMT in terms of the context of, of actual like medical or clinical applications. We, it seems like that's, that's one that we don't hear a ton about, but you guys are doing some very interesting work um, surrounding DMT and various different health, uh, health conditions. So yeah, I'd love to start off with that. And if you could just tell me, tell me a bit more about the, the sort of therapeutic potential that you guys have found for DMT. Sure. And, uh, I, I think most folks that are learning or know about the psychedelic space realize that most of the, uh, energy, whether it's psilocybin or psilocin or DMT is focused on treating depression, PTSD, um, and the, it's actually the psychedelic experience that's being focused on as being a paradigm or a game, ch game changer and, uh, talk therapy and sort of people that go through that experience, uh, or see themselves in maybe the world in a different, so it's experiential, but we're in a very different area. We're focusing on the effects of DMT which is a naturally occurring psychedelic drug uh, known as NN-dimethyltryptamine. 
uh, for its benefits to help the brain recover after an injury. And there's been a significant body of preclinical research done showing that DMT increases a protein in the brain called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a protein that's very involved in neuroplasticity, which is a process that the brain engages in to try to um, self-repair, make new connections, new synapses, connections and and this happens after an injury and that's what happens when you have a stroke a stroke is a uh, a a process where the oxygen and glucose is uh, deprived in an area of the brain either because of a bleed or a blockage and there's damage that results neurons die and and with that uh, is, is some sort of a deficit post stroke. You, maybe you have cognitive issues or you have motor function or, uh, you have an interruption of sight or sound and, uh, but the, and the brain after a stroke is, is trying to heal. And what we found in the preclinical research is that DMT helps the brain heal, but key, we're not delivering a psychedelic dose. The data is showing that you can help someone recover from an injury like the stro- like a stroke without sending them on that psychedelic tri- trip. And that's what we're focused on as a company. And would that be considered like a microdose of DMT that you guys are providing? Right. I mean, microdose isn't by definition tied to a concentration other than it's a, you could say it's a small dose, but you could have a small high dose. So microdose tells part of the story, but uh, in essence, th- that that's sort of the, the twist with us is that uh, um, Rick Strassman, who's on our advisory board and sort of considered the father of modern DMT research, he wrote a book called The Spirit Molecule. He established the psychedelic dose in man at 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. And in his research, he I think he had a, an ascending dose. I think he started his guys out at like 0.6 and 0.5 and 0.4 and his patients and they had these wild experiences, but they actually couldn't remember them. The higher the dose that he, they couldn't talk about it after. And so point two is that psychedelic level. What we're planning to do is to give patients a sub psychedelic dose, but for hours at a time. And we're doing a phase one study. It should start in the next few weeks in Europe where we uh, are giving healthy patients called a phase one study, an IV uh, solution of DMT. And we're going to give them a bolus injection first. That's an immediate shot. We're gonna bring their concentration up below the psychedelic level and then keep them there for six hours. We wanna keep hitting that receptor, the Sigma one receptors that take DMT up into the brain and you know, the objective is to encourage BDNF growth, which could then should start helping that healing process. So our study is micro, sub-psychedelic, but for longer durations. And in the second part of our phase one, patients will come back and we're going to do that six hour dose every two days for two weeks. And this is the first time DMT has been studied in this way. We don't expect any issues with toxicity. But what we are trying to be informed on is we want to give people the maximum concentration of DMT based on the preclinical showing that the more DMT you get, the more BDNF is encouraged and the, and the, and the less infarct volume, the less damage area and the reduced deficit. That's what we're seeing in the preclinical research. Yeah, and I'd love to just expand on that. So, so based on on the preclinical research and what we know about the way DMT influences the brain, um, you know, what sort of uh, changes or, or improvements are you hypothesizing that we might see in terms of this study with DMT in in human subjects following yeah. a stroke? So, so let's sort of go through the 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 process, and and I think it'll be helpful to listeners. So, you. Um, Let's go right back to somebody finding you or with you when you may experience a stroke. If you're lucky, you're going to be with a loved one and they call 911 right away. If you're not so lucky, you may be alone and a family member finds you either in bed or on the couch and you've had a stroke 
days ago, but you're, so it's sort of key when you are able to get to uh, medical care. So, but let's say you, you, you've been identified as having a possible stroke. Someone calls 911, you get to the hospital. We need to scan your brain and we need to find out if you have a block or a bleed. And um, about 85% is a blockage in the brain. That's called an ischemic stroke. And 15% is a hemorrhagic where you have a, a bursting of the blood vessel and you have blood saturating in the brain. The results are similar. You've got deprived oxygen and, and, and deprived uh, glucose and you've got this damage and you've got to deal with it. So now you're uh, determined to be hemorrhagic or ischemic. And for an ischemic stroke, about 85% of patients, about 15% can be treated. And you're either treated with a clot busting drug called a TPA, or they mechanically try to go in and remove the clot. But the clot has to be in an LVO, a large vessel, called a large vessel occlusion, where they can actually mechanically they do a groin puncture, they send up a catheter, very tiny, and they try to remove that clot. 85% of people will be just basically under watchful waiting. They're hydrated, they reduce their blood pressure and their heart rate, and they just are waiting for the body's natural process to, to remove that clot, and then the healing starts. So when you ask, well, what will DMT do? We can look to the, the rat stroke study that was done by Nardi in Hungary about two years ago, where they uh, take rats, they create a stroke injury in the brain, they actually stop the flow of blood to one hemisphere, and um, they, uh, they then uh, stop, they open up the vessel again, so you've had the damage, and they treated some of the mice with DMT, and some of the mice were untreated. And in the untreated group, you had loss of motor function and basically the the rat is trying to grab food with the damaged limb if it's a right hemisphere it's the left side and so on the rats that got dmt there were two significant differences one they had a diminished area of damage in the brain that showed neuroprotective elements and the rat's motor function in the DMT control group, almost fully recovered. So, you know, uh, DMT thought to increase BDNF. BDNF is, plays a very big role in recovery. We know that you will reach 80% of your neuronal recovery after a stroke, your personal recovery, within four and a half weeks. After six months, there's almost no change, but the first four and a half weeks are key. That's when your brain is going into overdrive to try to, using neuroplasticity, bridge the gap caused by the damage, the injury, make new connections so that you can either relearn, you know, you read about people that go to therapy, they relearn how to walk, they relearn how to talk. And they're doing that because the therapists are forcing the, the, the patient and their pathways to be focused on a particular goal and that is part also of the recovery but bdnf has been shown to to support and augment that recovery so that's what we would be hoping for less damaged area and diminished deficit post stroke that would be super exciting because i know that stroke is, is something that just just in in my field and and from talking to colleagues i mean it sounds like it's just something very difficult to treat um you know, with, with the current the current technologies we have or yeah. approaches and, and hundreds of stroke drugs have failed it is mm -hmm. almost i think um researchers of law i think clinicians have lost a bit of hope and most of the drugs have been trying to to reduce the damage while the stroke's happening. But our focus will be a, a real paradigm change. Our, our objective is to see if we can help that healing process. And uh, that's really never been done before. So it's, uh, and at a sub-psychedelic dose. So it's, it's really a cool, who would think that a psychedelic drug could, would still be active biologically in essence at a, sub psychedelic dose but it can help the brain heal it's really a i think it's cool it's super cool to, yeah to me <laughs> what so 
tell me about what what caused you guys to choose DMT rather than uh, another psych because I I'm aware that a lot of the psychedelics can can increase BDNF. Um, what what stood out about DMT and why did you guys choose it? Great question. Um, the when when we first started to look at getting into this space, and I'm I'm candid about the story. A, a large investor, we're a publicly traded company up on the Canadian Stock Exchange, and one of my larger investors said, "Hey, why don't you look at the psychedelic space?" This was about two years ago, and I said, uh, "Really?" And he said, "Listen, it's a hot space investment wise." And I said, "Well." You know, we're not we're not going into this with a vertical marketing. We're not going to set up clinics and hire doctors. And I said, we're a pharma development company, so there has to be a pharma play here. So I, I unleashed my science team, and I said, uh, dig in. And so uh, I think they started with an open mind. Our chief science officer and co-founder of Elgenon, Dr. Mark Williams, had a background in stroke, and um, he sort of connected the dots. He saw this early research. There was a researcher at the University of California by the name of Olson. And Olson did what I consider really to be a breakthrough study. He took cortical neurons, so neurons from the cortex, uh, from rats. And uh, this was in vitro, so not in an animal. And he exposed the neurons to three psychedelic drugs, LST, amphetamine, and DMT. And then he had a control uh, group of neurons, which just received the media. They, they were just being grown. And so the neuron showed some growth that wasn't exposed to any of the drugs. But in all of the neurons exposed to psychedelic drugs, you had this growth. And DMT was really one of the most, it had, the, they measure in sort of a concentric circles around the core of the neuron, how many, they're called dendritic spines. It's, it, it's like if you pulled a, a petunia out of the garden, you'd see all the entanglement of the roots. That's sort of what it looks like out of a neuron. You've got all of these spines coming out and these spines are actually where the synapses are occurring along the spine and at the ends. And that's where the neur neur neurons are speaking to each other in essence. So you had this solid density of growth. Actually, number one, it was called a class effect. Scientists love that because they saw growth in all the psychedelic drugs. You spoke about it earlier. The, the DMT had some of the, the greatest density of this growth, but more importantly is that DMT has a half-life of eight minutes in the body. And LSD, which also showed some of the highest growth, it has a half-life of 12 hours. So you've heard somebody say it's a bad trip. They've had a bad trip. It's a long, bad trip. DMT also was called the businessman's high. Because, you know, it's you're in and out. And so that was attractive. And so we, we zeroed in and then we found this stroke study with DMT in Hungary. So the team came back and said, look, DMT is really, it's got neuroplastic effects. It's out of the body quickly. So it's an ideal uh, agent. And uh, then we said, okay, we're not moving forward unless we can get some intellectual property. It's the problem with all companies in this space. DMT is naturally occurring, psilocybin, psilocin. So every company is trying to stake new ground by having some intellectual property. So you're either going to make a change to the compound. Uh, you're going to uh, alter its structure a bit, hoping that the core structure is still doing the same thing. And you're going to file new patents and then you're going to have to be doing research around it. And hopefully at the end of the day, whatever change you've made to that molecule, psilocybin, it's called a, a derivative of it. So you'll see some companies will say, we have our own compound. These are these chemists, smart chemists who are looking at it saying, hey, we can make a very small change to the molecule, call it new but still hope it does the same thing. So we've done something similar with DMT. We've altered the salt form of DMT. DMT has usually been manufactured as a fumarate. And basically, without dragging everybody through the rose bushes too much here, a salt, about 50% of the drugs you take from 
physicians, prescriptions are in assault form. Assault is added to the, to the free base. It either makes it more soluble, so it's easier to manufacture, it's easier to uh, produce it in a formulation that can be delivered, has the, a better PK in the body. The salt itself might make the drug more efficacious. And so you can change the salt to a drug and you've got a new drug, even though the core structure is still, or the free base form is still the same original. And that's what we've done. So it's playing with chemistry, but it happens to be a change. When you change out the salt, you don't have to go back to square one with the FDA and you can uh, move it up along. You can kind of hop and skip and jump over preclinical. So that's what we've done with DMT. Sorry, that's one hell of a long answer to your question. No, no, that, that was an interesting tangent. So I, yeah, that it, so I don't know if there's any research uh, yet on this um, or, you know, if you have a hypothesis about this, but in terms of if, you know, psychedelics such as DMT, if people were to use them, like, it, it, do you think they have any application as like a preventative thing to like actually prevent someone from experiencing a stroke in the first place? Or do we not really have any well, clinical research on that? Yeah, we don't, there is no research, but you, you can do some, you know, l let's talk a bit about the two types of stroke. So type number one is a, is a bleed in your brain. And you're going to have a bleed in your brain because of two reasons. One, you have a genetic defect in your, uh, in your vascular structure where you've got a thinning of your blood vessel. And over time, the thinning ruptures and you have blood released. It can also be in combination. You know, why do you have that thinning? Well, it could be congenital from birth, can have a weakness, just like you blow up a balloon. If that balloon's manufactured perfectly, the balloon thickness is all the same around, but you may have a weakness and you have that, that hemorrhage or bursting. Second, you could have elevated blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, just like you have your garden hose attached to your house, it comes out at a certain rate. You have water pressure, pushes that water out. And, but if you have too much pressure, you may have a weakness in your hose somewhere and now you've sprung a leak. And that's what happens. So I can't see, if you think about how DMT is functioning, you know, for DMT to reduce hemorrhagic stroke, DMT would have to be building and strengthening blood vessels. I don't see it. Or it would be reducing blood pressure. And, you know, there are lots of drugs that reduce blood pressure. So I don't see DMT as being prophylactic in a hemorrhagic. In an ischemic stroke, you have a blockage. And that blockage could be an embolism that's traveled from another part of your body and it's lodged in your brain. You may have an, a bursting of the inside of a, a vessel, not a full, but maybe you have uh, 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 art, arterial disease. So there's kind of a fibrotic tissue. Uh, so you've got different reasons for that blockage. Would DMT reduce that? risk? I don't think so based on the mechanisms and how we know DMT to work. So I think those are, those are other, and I think strategies are in place and, and medications that can perhaps, you know, blood thinning. Uh, if you're, if you have an issue, but you know, you as you get older, sometimes thinning the blood can lower your, you may have AFib or other conditions. You want to thin the blood because you want to reduce the chance post heart attack of another blockage. That can help it. So I don't see DMT in that role. When the stroke starts occurring, in the rat model, they gave DMT quite quickly after the insult. There seemed to be less of a damaged area. Now that's other mechanisms involved. You know, once you've got a blockage and once the oxygen starts to get starved in the area and glucose is starved, there's a cascade of events where other cells get damaged, other brain cells. So DMT could play a role once it's happened. Prophylactic, I don't see it right now. Okay, understood. What about, are, are there any future uh, research trials that you guys are planning on, uh, you know, doing, you know, with DMT? Like, are there other applications besides stroke 
um, but kind of like a, you know, medical, um, medical things that could be treated potentially with DMT based on the mechanisms in which we know. Yeah, I, I think the one, one of the obvious would be just generally, I think we have to better understand how do you define an injury to the brain? You've got a traumatic brain injury. You're in a motorcycle accident. You've hit hit your head and the brain has been injured or damaged or you have some sort of a physical, you know, you've had a uh, intrusion into the skull and you damaged tissue. So that's an injury. Would DMT, that's one area of, of potential. Uh, the second would be, can you view dementia, MS, is that an injury of sorts? Does BDNF play a role? Because that's the right now, that seems to be the mechanism of action. DMT is increasing BDNF. BDNF is involved in neuroplasticity. So if you started to look at it and say, in what other conditions is neuroplasticity helpful? Those would be potential areas of research. And you would do some preclinical first, so animal or in vitro. And then you uh, you could very well go right into a phase two study because once we're doing a phase one study, which is DMT, intravenous, six hour duration, so longer periods of time. Once we have that data, we could use it to treat stroke or to do a study for stroke. We could use it for an MS study. We could use that data. It's the same. You know, what you're, what you're basically confirmed is that long durations of DMT are not toxic to the body. They're not damaging the heart, liver, kidneys. There's no aggregation of buildup where you get, you know, if you get too much of it, now you're in a toxic that we, we, cause it clears very quickly and there's no uh, suggestion that that's the case. So we could use our phase one study and with some reasonable animal data, you know, don't forget, you have to convince an investigator somewhere around the world that he has patients that have MS that does he want to try DMT on? So you have to come with data in hand that says, hey, we did an MS study in a rat or, an, or a mouse model and there was a benefit. Let's now go into humans. We've got our phase one already done. It's safe. You could get some cachet there. So there are other areas we could pursue. Got it. What about, um, you know, in terms of after a stroke, I've, I've heard that it's common that people have, you know, different sort of mental health, uh, psychiatric symptoms that that may um, that may occur. And I was wondering if it would be reasonable to hypothesize if you know DMT is going to have any effect on on people's like outlook um, after a stroke. Like, you know, you guys are focusing on like the biological effects and and increasing BDNF and what that is going to do positively to um to aid in recovery but do you think that there's also like a, a psychological component that the dmt might be helping people actually cope with you know a stroke being a huge yeah. kind of traumatic event in someone's life yeah it's a very good point and and actually part of this um at the microdose convention that algernon sponsored this is the world's largest psychedelic conference uh, I did a business presentation on Friday and on Saturday, I did a science presentation and I shared the stage with Dr. Rick Strassman, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has written the book, The Spirit Molecule. And he added some interesting additions to using DMT with stroke patients, because even at a micro dose level, it could show anti-depression benefits. And also some, some capacity as an analgesic or a pain, pain reduction. And although we're not sending people on that psychedelic experience where you're seeing the almighty or aliens and colors and everything that people describe this and the psychedelic experience is a combination of things, experiential, it's visual, it's auditory. Um, I think the acute use of DMT post stroke can have some immediate benefit. If it reduces the damage, does that mean that a patient may be less depressed after? I think after the four and a half weeks where you've got the majority of your recovery behind you, 
Maybe then DMT is used, but at a psychedelic dose. People now could, could go back to that treatment, just like it's being investigated now for DMT, DMT and depression. Uh, if you've, you know, let's say you have a deficit and it is, and it's life-changing and it's not as bad as it would have been if you didn't have the DMT, but now you're still struggling. I think you should still have access to ketamine or other, any other drug. Would DMT use acutely during the treatment period reduce long-term? Don't have any data. I think acutely though, based on the data that there could be a, re a reduction of the symptoms of either pain or depression that's occurring during really the toughest period. And that would be when you've had this injury, you may be in a state of confusion, and uh, uh, DMT, even at a microdose level, could be helping you get through that. That you could say there's data. The other, just there's no data to, to say either way. Understood. Okay. And so if, if this study, you know, showed really positive outcomes and, um, you know, DMT was able to be used to uh, treat, you know, stroke in, in human subjects or human patients, like what, what sort of model, like would, would it be something that someone would go into their neurologist's office and they'd get, uh, you know, like an infusion of DMT or is that? Like, it would what? be, it would be right at the, so if we go back to that, so you 911, you get to the hospital, you get your scan, you're hemorrhagic, you're ischemic. If you're ischemic, you're getting a clot buster. They're trying to remove the, or you're in ICU being monitored. You're getting DMT there. I see you're getting it intravenously and you'd be getting it for long periods. And what we hope to show, because that's our second study, our, our first study is just healthy patients, six hour duration, first part, and then every two days over two weeks, six hour duration. Once we have that data, phase two, we're in emergency DMT and placebo, trying to help those patients. Now, if DMT can also show that it can be used during the four and a half weeks after your stroke, where your brain is repairing itself, then you might see some outpatient use of DMT. But uh, very early to tell, would that be a patch? You know, let's say you're in a hospital. I think the average hospital stay post-stroke is 13 days. So ideally, if we're treating you, because the best way to get the concentration up in your blood and hold it is intravenous. If I give you a pill, you take that pill, it's, pill, it's got to go through digestion, it gets absorbed, first pass through the liver. You know, there's a reason why you're delivering certain medications IV, it's because it's immediately available and it's in the bloodstream and you get your concentration up. So theoretically, we could treat you IV while you're in that hospital, recovering, if you've had minor deficit, you're, you're going to be released maybe within a day or two. But if you've got, so the average stay is 13 days, you could continue to deliver IV. It becomes inconvenient when you're released and you're at home, but you're still going through therapy to be going and getting IV. So maybe some other type of delivery, but it would be prescription and control. So, and again, you're not going to be getting that psychedelic, psychedelic experience um, we don't know exactly how much we're going to bring the dose to 0.15 milligrams or some going to get two. it. We just have to see, but right now our, our belief is that we can help you out without having you enter any hallucination stage. And so, uh, in that application, just the, the way we deliver it, it, it won't, uh, there won't be any issues of, uh, a concern about somebody you know, being alone and, and all of a sudden uh, having a hallucinogenic dose and now they're on their own and this is something happened. They don't know what's going on and there's confusion and risk of injury, you know, that we don't, uh, it's, it's early, but that's sort of how I see this perhaps rolling out. Right. It's, it's interesting to me to think about like, it, and it seemed like a, a big division just observing like at, at the microdose conference where there's the camp that, that believes that like, you know, the, the psychedelic experience is like hugely responsible for, for patients improvement in all of these different uh, conditions, I guess, usually, you know, focused on the mental health side. 
Um, but then there's also obviously drug development companies and researchers who are looking at just, you know, something that modifies say like the 5-HT2A receptor yes. without actually causing psychedelic effects. And they're still seeing, uh, you know, from, from what I've understood, they're still seeing really positive benefits. So it's, it's interesting to, you know, think about how that will play out because it seems like so, uh, it's so divided, you know, in terms of people on either camp thinking you need the psychedelic exp experience or no, that's just sort of it, like a, it could, could be both. Yeah. And the data will tell. I mean, at some point, you know, this is all driven by data, not anecdotal. So-and-so took it and they had this response. Frank took it, Mary, Betty. It's all, if you study it under clinical conditions, you're going to have the data. It, and the data will show that in, in, in depression, if, if they do a multi-dose study, do you have a reduction of depression with an increasing dose or descending dose? Does it have to be psychedelic or not? Um, therapists, if you've, I mean, my understanding is once, you know, from a depression perspective, by having that, that experience, it's important because it's just so different than what your normal everyday life is. And that uh, it can open up the potential and the possibility either that we're not alone or that there's a supreme, whatever people feel. And so I think, it, I, I think we might find that uh, in some cases, a sub-psychedelic dose is all you need to, to treat certain conditions, but in other conditions, the psychedelic dose is better, but that should come out in the data. The data is the data. And you've heard that so many times with scientists. It's it's let's go where the data takes us. And what we have to make sure is that scientists have the freedom to access these compounds. They can do their research without the fear and the um, all the political elements and the control and and I would say mostly fear. That uh, that's the worst. You know, scientists need to have access to the compounds so we can study them, proper controlled studies, and let's look at the data and then we go from there. That's the best bet. Was it extremely difficult to be able to uh, get access to, to DMT to use like in, in this study just based on the legality? Almost impossible. And we have wide and deep connections globally. We reached out to because we decided two years ago to get into the space. So we reached out to two or three of our Chinese manufacturing vendors, forbidden, forbidden to talk about it. They can't even have it in an email. And we, we can't make it's a schedule one, uh, jail or worse. Uh, highly restricted everywhere, US, Canada, Europe. There were a few companies that had the license to make it. Some universities in the US, because each state law is a little different. And just, just to make you aware, there's two types of, of drug synthesis. One is called research grade, where you can use it in animals or in vitro. But if you want to use it in human beings, it's called CGMP. CGMP grade is produced under a quality system where you all of the impurities that can happen in manufacturing. I mean, you can't be giving somebody a synthesized compound unless it's produced under very strict conditions. So you have two, even research grade difficult just to use it in animals, hard to get. Um, we got lucky. There's a Canadian company called Dalton Manufacturing in Ottawa. We had a relationship with them previously. They had a license to produce it. They got an amendment with Health Canada. We produced our first quantity and then we formulated it for IV solution. So, so hard to get a very little school in the U S reached out to us recently called Yale. I heard, I'm sure you've heard of, and, uh, Yale asked Algenon, could you please help us get some DMT? Think about that top school in the world, top psychiatrist wanting to do a research study, can't get DMT would have cost them a half a million dollars if even they could get it produced, even in the small quantity that they'd need for a study. And they came to Elgin and said, we need your help. And when I said, yeah, we're not a charity. I'm running a 
a publicly traded company. So we'll help you. But what, what do we get out of it as well? We want access to the data and, uh, and other benefits in case some IP came from it. And we did a deal with Yale to help them. And we announced that a few uh, weeks ago. Now they're doing a depression study and we're not focused on it, but they are doing a study where they're doing ascending doses and descending doses. And all of that data can be helpful to a company like Elginon. So uh, it just, there's an example of how tough it is to get. You, you think that uh, the, you know, Yale, I mean, you don't get any better in terms of a name and they had, they couldn't get it. So Algernon helped. Yeah, that that's definitely something that, sobering, I mean, sobering thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously that, that is, is that point is always touched upon, it seems like, you know, but in, in just in terms of the, the access to some of these compounds that can, you're now showing tremendous efficacy. It's just, they're so restricted, uh, yeah. makes, makes the research very difficult. But you know, props to you guys for for fighting through that and and being able to do this because I think it's really meaningful work. Thank you. So you know, we're we're coming up uh, kind of close to the end of the show, but I wanted to just kind of see you know what what sort of what, when you look towards the future of you know Algernon and and maybe you know psychedelic uh, you know drug treatments in general, um, what sort of things excite you? What what sort of what can we expect kind of going forward? Well, I, I think we're really just at the, the beginning of the investigation of these compounds. And since the late 60s, when they were demonized and, you know, uh, uh, because of the Vietnam War and the whole hallucinogenic drug uh, with the protests and the restrictions, you've had this stifling of research. And I, I think we're seeing a shift. Uh, the fact that we've been approved for our study in Europe, there have been other studies, ketamine's been approved. Ketamine was approved for only one reason, not political, it was the data. The data showed efficacy. So I think we're at the beginning of exploring these compounds, better understanding their role. Uh, DMT is present in, in man, in animals, in plants. What's its function? How can we harness potential, you know, any drug, uh, one of the top chemotherapy drugs is produced from a plant. And so it's not surprising that plants, uh, which are, you know, you can harvest these psychedelic compounds. Some have been used for a thousand years and more, uh, in different, uh, for, as different, uh, treatments for different treatments. I think we're just at the beginning. And so the potential is exciting. It's a new area, neuropsychopharmacology. And uh, we're very hopeful that DMT is going to help stroke patients. It's bleak. 85% of us that have an ischemic stroke are just going to be sitting there in a hospital bed with the physicians hoping that the stroke will end the blockage and we can start recovering. And that's not good enough for, for us. Algernon wants to to see if we can help. This would be a global drug, a global treatment. And I think it could change. Uh, it'll change a lot of lives if we're successful. So, Awesome. And if people, if listeners want to find out more about this study or Algernon's work in general, where would you direct them to? El Algernonpharmaceuticals.com. We've got a, a great website. There's uh, in, informational videos, lots of articles. You learn about the company and our research and, uh, and feel free to send an e email. I mean, I, I get probably 30 emails a week from folks who are going through a stroke or a family member and just to the level of, uh, of uh, you know, pe people are struggling and suffering. And uh, we're just part of the process. You know, we're doing our role to investigate it. Other drugs may come along that are as helpful or more helpful, but uh, we're doing our part. And if you want to learn more, uh, come and visit us at our website and, uh, and feel free to send an email. Love to hear from people. Perfect. And if you guys enjoyed the show today, go ahead and uh, you, will, you can listen to the show, the audio version on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or most other major audio streaming platforms. If you would instead like to see the full video episode, you can go ahead 
and head over to our YouTube channel, Neuroflex, and you are O-F-L-E-X. Uh, you can see the full episodes on there. So Chris, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today and just sharing your knowledge and expertise and, and you know, really thank you for, for doing such meaningful work that, uh, you know, is, is going to potentially be incredibly impactful for, for, you know, lots of, uh, you know, stroke victims and their families. So, you know, really cool stuff you, you're working on. Thanks for having me and enjoy the talk and take care.